Hey friends, Dr. Athanasius, Wittenberg Project. Thank you so much for your support. Subscribe, follow us. We really appreciate that. Uh, I am forced to have to record a shorter video because my daughter is right here with me and she's sleeping. And trust me, I don't want to wake her up because putting her back to sleep is a long process. So just wanted to record a really short video. Um, right now we're going through some uh, major issues as a, as a nation, as a country, as a people, because of what everybody knows about the coronavirus. And uh, to be perfectly honest, um, I tend to be a little annoyed when, I don't want to say that it's blown out of proportion because that, not, that's not, honestly, that's not what I think. It, I think, you know, this is a, a situation that um, you have to treat with proper care. Um, it is affecting a lot of people. Uh, it is, it, it's not, it's, yeah, it's right, it, it's true. It's not the worst thing that has ever happened to humanity. We've had perhaps worse diseases. But, you know, what I've always said is that when someone or a group of people are telling you that something is in their mind dangerous, even if you know or even if you think that it's not dangerous, you still want to give it its proper uh, uh, dimension of significance or importance. Because like, I'll give you an example. To those of you who are married or are in a relationship, if your spouse, if your husband, if your wife tells you that some situation is really bothering you, right? Even if you think that it's something that is not that important, the fact of the matter is that to that person, it is important. And trust me, it will be important for you if the person gets to a point where they're ready to abandon the relationship <laughs> or or just um, do whatever. So that's where I'm coming from. It, but at the same time, it can be a little annoying because everybody's uh, not overreacting, but everybody's reacting. Everybody has something to say about it. And I'm a bigger, I'm a big hypocrite right now because I'm saying something about it, but not really. But uh, to that dimension, I think it's overblown. Everybody has an opinion. Um, you know, everybody wants to give uh, uh, advice. Some people are saying, don't worry about it. It's something about Trump. It's about the Democrats, blah, 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 all that nonsense. But anyways, today going through Twitter, um, I saw a very unfortunate uh, tweet from, I think he's a Reformed Baptist pastor or something like that. He's, he's not Lutheran. He's not Anglican. I, I would bet that he is probably a Baptist or uh, Reformed Baptist or whatnot. And, you know, my parents used to tell me, like, I remember when I was a kid, uh, you know, parents tend to give you advice as to things that you shouldn't do in certain situations that would kind of give you better opportunities to, to prosper. So here, so here's a tweet. I just want to read it, and we go from there. It's already three minutes. It says, my home... My homebound people know that they aren't involved in church. I'm sure Askel, so Askel is another pastor. Uh, I think his name is Tom. I'm sure Askels do too. Recognizing this is every is an everyday thing for all but the most derelict pastors. So I would imagine that the last sentence, by the way, derelict means... Uh, neglectful. So I had to look up that word. It's not a word that I've seen very much. And so it, it means neglectful. All right. Okay. And so I suppose that he is saying that if you, because the, the, the point of the tweet here is uh, if you are not in church or if you're homebound, meaning if you're sick, if you are under like right now we're going through a situation where the government is saying that for public health concerns we shouldn't go anywhere he is pretty much equating people under those conditions with people that don't go to church because they were they stayed up la uh, late the, uh, saturday night or they want to watch an nfl game or they went partying and they drank too much he or just they're just just bad christians that don't really put a lot of uh, of weight into showing up for church. So this pastor is saying that he's pretty much putting both in the same package because 
every pastor knows that there's going to be bad sheep, right? There's, uh, there's also people there that are not really Christians. But to say that, in, but to make this tweet in this situation, under these circumstances, to people that are, let's say, sick or elderly or who are afraid to get out of their homes because they don't want to get infected and by getting infected, you know, affecting per perhaps their co-workers or elderly family members and stuff like that. To do that, I think it's just, <laughs> it's just unfair. It's just bad thinking. So here's what I wanted to get at. Full confession. I, I One day I aspire to join a seminary. I really want to be a ministry. And I would have thought that part of the education that you get as a seminary, as a future pastor, is to have some sort of interpersonal skills. Um, know how to communicate with, uh, you know, people that you don't know at all, build relationships, perhaps have difficult conversations, confronting sin. That's not an easy job. You have to, it's an art, it's a craft that you have to learn how to do. It's a skill. So I would, I would imagine that they would teach you that, right? And I would also imagine that in, not forget seminary, in the course of your life, you should be able to pick up some basic common sense discernment, all right, knowledge, wisdom as to how to speak, when to speak certain things, to whom to say certain things, in front of whom are you going to say certain things, etc., etc. So like, if you are a healthy person, let me turn this off, my air conditioner, my heater. So if you are a healthy person, right, and you are trying to build a team, right, you, you want to create a team environment. It doesn't matter where. It can be your job. It can be um, an NBA team, a high school basketball team, football, whatever it is. A family, a church, which are teams. There are certain things that you don't want to do to, to your people. And I'll give you an example. If, if, I, if someone in the team is hurt, right? They twisted their ankle. They cannot play. They cannot go to the gym. They can go to practices. And you've, don't, you've known this guy for, they've played with you for three, four, five years. All right. And if you come out to this person and you say, you know, you're having a conversation or you say something on social media and you address this guy that is hurt, this guy, this woman that is hurt. And you say, well, they know that, you know, they're homebound, they're injured. And so they're really not part of this team anymore. How does that come across? How do you think those words are going to be received by your teammate? Do you think they're going to be happy about it? Do you think you're being wise in saying those things? Do you really think that that's going to cooperate to your goal, which is, if you're again, if you're a sane, mature, healthy person, you know, and you don't even have to be the coach, but if, especially if you're a coach, if you're a pastor, why would you do that? Why would you do that? I would, I would imagine that there's just basic stuff. Basic stuff. If you're trying to build a team, you want to have people that want to be there. You want to let them know that they are appreciated, even in their absence. And even if they are bad team members, bad ch church men or whatnot, this is not the way to come around it. If, if I'm having a conversation with you, you shouldn't say to their face, and you shouldn't say it behind their back. Because at the end of the day, what really matters is the team and the individuals there. That's just, that's just how leaders work, how leaders function. You have to deal with criticism, that's true. You have to deal with X and Y situation. But at the end of the day, it's the team that matters, especially in the church setting. And here's another thing. Because I hear a lot of people saying, you know, this is the truth. I just speak truth. I keep it, I keep it real. Hmm. There's a lot of inconvenient, it's, there's a lot of truths, truths out there that only if you are, if you have like mental situation, I'm not trying to make fun of it because there's like, like autistic people, right? It, every, you know, one of their symptoms is that, uh, they are not well, they, they are very bad at picking up people's emotions. That's just a universal 
thing that we all know of. So they're not very good at reading body language, reading facial um, um, signs or whatever you want to call that. They're not very good at that, okay? So uh, unless, if you are artistic individual, I understand with I understand the situation. I, I, I would empathize with that person. They just are impaired. But if you're not in that situation uh, and you're saying, just keep it real, I just speak the truth. Well, yeah, we want to be people that speak the truth, but there's discernment. As I said before at the beginning of the video, there's a time to say it. There's a place to say it. You have to say you have to sort of, you, you want to keep truth, but you don't deliver truth in the same measure and manner to everybody. I can't speak to my wife truth in the same way that I speak to my child. <laughs> it's, I, thought, I thought that was common knowledge. I can speak truth to a coworker the same way that I speak truth to my boss. I have to show common sense, wisdom, in how to deal with certain situations. So, yes, it is true that there's people that miss out on church that are neglectful, but these people here don't fall in that, under that category. And people that miss church tomorrow or the next week because of the quarantine issue or because they're just scared, the proper thing to do is not to say, you know what, uh, what is it that he says here? They're not really involved in church. That, wh what, is, what good does that do? Wh why, why would you say that? The proper thing that you want to do is you want to visit them, not just tweet. You visit them. And you want, to, you want to bring consolation to their homes. You want to tell them that Christ has their back. In fact, this is one of the things that uh, Luther said in his uh, little letter to the people down there. I think it was Wittenberg. Yeah, he went Wittenberg. And uh, he wrote this, this, uh, this uh, letter open letter uh, regarding, I forget the title, should, should we flee because of the black death and stuff like that? And so as pastors or friends or whatnot, you want to bring consolation to this person. You can tell this person, hey, you can trust Christ. He got, he's got your back. You know, this person may have real concerns because he has a family member that's dying. See what I'm saying? Like, there's a lot of ways that you can approach this situation. Saying, you know, saying they are involved in church. I don't think that's the most helpful one. Why do we, to, to a person, again, the circumstances and the scenario say this individual is staying homebound because why are they having this conversation? It's, because, it's not because of whatever. It's because of the coronavirus. This is what we are discussing as a society, as a country, even in Twitter land. And you are going to approach this to this. You're going to approach an individual who has real concerns. You're not really involved here. Like, what is wrong with you? Like, honestly, that is, the, that is the question that I have for guys like this, or women like, that, that, that speak like this. What is your problem? What are you aiming at? Bruising the broken reed, destroying people? Just making them walk away from the faith, the church? You, at least your church. <laughs> and here's the last thing. And, I'm, and perhaps this is the first time that you're going to hear this, but here's, here's the thing. If you are a young man, and you are dating a woman and you you are a truth teller you always keep it real right and you can't contain yourself because you know this is who i am i am me i do me right well come here let me let me give you a little secret here being brass like that like being brass like that might cause her to dump you. If she dumps you, don't be shocked. She's probably sick and tired of you because you're rude. You are unwise. And she's sick and tired of being pummeled, of being embarrassed by you. Because there are certain ways that you speak to women that you don't speak to everybody else. And pastor, your wife, she might be regretting the fact that she married you. She might be extremely frustrated. And the only reason that perhaps she's not praying for something to happen to you is because she's a Christian and she's a good person and she has perhaps kids with you. Otherwise, like every other normal human being, they would have nothing to do with you. 
She's probably wishing that she knew who you were before you guys got married because you suck. So you probably think that you are cute. You, you strike me as one of those guys that, uh, you know, you're a real, you're a real man. You, you always keep it real, right? So if, if someone has bath breath or, or, or if whatever, something that's socially embarrassing, you, you always keep it real because you're a prophet. And I'm going to go and, and tell them how it is. Wisdom, that's for sissies. That's for clowns. I have to put this guy, I have to put this woman in her place. Well, yeah, okay, you go ahead, do that. But come here, let me, let me share a secret with you. This is perhaps why you suck. This is perhaps why your ministry is going down. It's not because of the gospel. It's not because people reject the gospel. It's because you suck. You have no interpersonal skills. You don't know how to speak to women. You don't have, you don't know how to speak to children. You cannot make a proper distinction. You have no discernment. And so it's not because you, it's not because you are a prophet like Isaiah that people are walking away from you or that people abandon you just like they did some disciples abandon Jesus. No, you're being abandoned because you're a jerk, because you always speak out of time, out of term and have no discernment. Like, for example, certain things you don't want to say to a person, some corrections, you don't want to do it in public because you're embarrassing the person. You have to learn that. To, to a person that is suffering, you don't say st crass stuff. You don't hurt them more. If someone just died, you don't go to their family member and keep it real by telling them, I think your son went to hell. That's not the time. There's never a time to speak like that so it's not truth that people are walking away from you is because you're a fool and have no social etiquette no social skills you don't know how to speak you're just terrible and if in this in this profession if you want to be a social worker if you want to be a coach a life coach a pastor a professor a team leader in a factory you have to learn how to address and talk to people. And you just don't go to people that are scared, concerned, hurt because of family members that have passed away and just say, you know what? What is the phrase? You're not really involved in the church. And for me not to be a derelict pastor, I have to tell you this because I'm really faithful. I'm a really faithful pastor. Dude, you are a fool, a biblical fool, a biblical fool. And don't hide your incompetence, your lack of social skills and your negligence behind a fake pious reason such as, well, they just hate me just the same way that they hated Jesus. No, no. They don't want anything to do with you because you suck. That's the reality of the matter. Dr. Athanasius, Wittenberg Project, subscribe, join us. Thank you so much. See you. Bye-bye.